Good morning. I'm Dr. Ferris Beasley, a retired veterinarian from here in Fayetteville, Lincoln County. And we're located down on South Main in front of a rather significant building that's now the home of the Fayetteville Lincoln County Museum. We're going to tell you a little bit later what it was in times past. Today is March the 17th, 2008, and we're going to tour this building, which was is known as the old Borden Milk Plant. The Borden Milk Plant came to Fayetteville in 1927. 1927 represented some pretty tough times for our area, the whole South as far as that goes. It was the beginning of the Depression, and this plant coming to Fayetteville was the first major, one of the first major industries to come south of the Mason-Dixon line from the north. Uh, and the story behind Fayetteville getting this plant uh, goes something like this, and these records are in the uh, Vanderbilt University essays on the industrialization of the South, and they tell us that the president of the Coca-Cola plant, which was founded in Atlanta, as you know, went north begging northern industries to come south and bring us some economic help. He called on the Borden Milk Plant in Cincinnati, Ohio, and from that visit and that trip, this plant came into reality. It came in 1927. It bought milk from dairy farmers in five counties, Lincoln County, Moore County, Murray County, uh, Bedford County, and Giles County. And uh, the first month that it was in operation, it paid $25,000 to dairy farmers for their milk. Now $25,000 doesn't sound like a lot of money today. Of course, this was in the beginning. It was uh, just getting the plant started, but that represented some cash flow that these dairy farmers had not had before this time. At the peak of this plant's operation, it employed about 75 employees and it purchased milk from 1,200 different dairy farms. Uh, now, remember that farming was probably represented over 50% of the population at this time in history. Uh, the farmers didn't have a lot of cash flow. It was kind of a hand-to-mouth operation. So these milk checks that came to the farmers every two weeks uh, were a significant breakthrough. They could buy some things they never had before, and it was a, a great stimulus to the economy of our area, and as I said, it did bring, help bring our area out of the Great Depression, which is a, a very tough time for us. Okay, this Borden plant was built to produce butter. It was a butter plant. The raw milk was taken in from the dairy farms, unloaded in the back of this plant, and uh, churned into butter, and the final product was one pound cartons of butter which were loaded into trucks and railroad cars on the other side of the plant and shipped all over America. As we get ready to walk into this plant, we're going to be fortunate today in having with us some of the former employees of this plant who worked here years ago in their earlier years and are going to tell us a little bit about what happened inside this factory. The first person we're going to meet this morning is Becky Gross. I started to introduce these people as older employees, but I guess I should diplomatically use the term former employees. But uh, you have to remember that this plant's been closed for 41 years, so this uh, time frame represents an earlier time in their life and an earlier period in Fedville's history. Becky Gross uh, came uh, here early in her life, I think. Becky, tell us when you first came to the Borden Mill plant. I came in 1953. I had gotten out of high school and on Friday, and I came to work here on Monday. And I worked until, well, I believe I worked six or seven years here. Okay, now Becky uh, is married to Benny Gross, and she's presently involved in the Farmer's Auction Company, which has been probably older than Borden Company. It's about 50 years about old. About 50 years old, and uh, they run a formidable business that's vitally involved with agriculture with their son, Brian. Mm -hmm. And Becky, what were your duties here at the plant? Well, we all that worked in the office, we got the checks ready that went out. Then, while there was a plant in Shelville, one in Deckard, and one in Plaskin, and of course the one here, and we all fixed 
the checks for those people for their milk. And you're talking about plants that received milk just right. like this that's plant. right. Uh -huh. they, and they shipped the milk over here, or did they process they that? They processed there, I believe now. Okay. And you wrote checks to the farmers. That's correct. The, the uh -huh. dairymen that were supplying milk, and how often did they get a check? Twice a month. And they probably knew the day to look at the mailbox and watch <laughs> when that mail carrier came. Because they that sure was, did. That was their living. That's correct. That's uh -huh. pretty neat. Uh -huh. where, what general area from where we're standing were the offices located? The office was across the street in a building by itself. It and the feed house were separate okay, from that's the building. The diagonal corner across the way back That's there. correct. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Becky, was it pretty much an honor to get a job at a place like that at it, that time and because there weren't that many jobs. That's correct. And here uh, was one of the best paying jobs in the county, so I was real do, do you tickled to get the job. Do you remember what you started at? No, I don't. That's been too long back. <laughs> okay, great. All right. How many would have been in the office workforce? 15 or 20? No, or so? there that wasn't many? that many. Okay. I guess. Of course, you were working with computers at that time. No. <laughs> we had an ad machine. <laughs> and mostly hand ledgers. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. that's neat. And we made carbon of everything, you know, and you had to press hard. That was one of the yeah. first things I learned when that's, I came that's, here. That's good. Uh -huh. That's neat. And you were here seven or eight years? Yeah, that's correct. And then uh -huh. you moved on to I worked auction. down there uh -huh, ever since. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking at an aerial view of the Borden plant. And the caption down under this picture says this aerial photograph was taken in 1930. And one of our other employee guests this morning is going to tell us who probably took that picture because, you know, there wasn't a lot of aerial photography going on in Fayetteville in 1930. But this is an aerial shot of the Borden milk plant. Uh, and I'm looking at it upside down here for a minute, so I'm a little bit confused. Here's South Main, here the front. We came in through the courtyard right here, and we're standing in what's known as the High Bay area. Now, you're probably going to pan around a little bit later on this High Bay area. It's kind of a unique portion of the building. It's about three stories. The top of it is enclosed completely in glass, and this was a drying area of the plant. This is where milk was dried to form powdered milk. And in World War II, this particular room was a very important room because it dried milk, it dried eggs, and it dried lemons to be shipped overseas during World War II to our armed forces and our allied armed forces uh, across the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Uh, of course, the victory ships carried the supplies to our troops. Remember, in the 40s, not a lot of refrigeration, so these ships uh, didn't have capacity to carry refrigerated whole milk or eggs or lemons, so they were dried here. Now, I've talked to some of the World War II soldiers who ate uh, powdered milk that was reconstituted and ate powdered eggs. And, of course, these were country boys, farm boys used to fresh milk and fresh eggs. And they said it didn't taste very good, but it was the only link they had with milk. Now, we're going to talk to Jane Bradford now. Jane and her husband, Bill, both worked here. Uh, in earlier times. They now own Bradford Appliance with their sons. And uh, Jane, tell us about when you came to this plant. Ferris, I just worked here part-time uh, in high school in the late 50s. Worked a little bit after Bill and I married in 58, but I was just strictly part-time employee. My real connection with this was my mother and father were one of the first employees of this company in 28 and 29. That's pretty neat. So your family goes way, way back, back to the beginning since right. the plant started in 1927. Right. So that's pretty interesting. Right. And so you just did ordinary office type tasks, whatever was yes. assigned to you, that's what the you more, did. I didn't get into the real depth of the bookkeeping or anything like that. Jane so. has got some real interesting pictures over here that she brought with us and, and, and these represent Surely time that's that's some time back because these are the earliest first employees probably. Wow. Jane, you want to tell what that picture there represents? This picture is taken from Lincoln Avenue. Uh, this area here is probably where the present fire truck is. Uh, we are thinking this picture was probably made in 19, 
and 29 because of some of the people that we were able to pick out, which I wish we could pick them all, but we can't. Um, Mr. Fulmer was the office manager. Then my mother was standing next to him. She worked in the office. Um, a Mr. Frank Pittenger, who was the first field man for Borden's. We think this is him. And his son, Buck Pittenger, worked here later on. Um, I noticed there were three women who worked probably in the lab. They have the same outfits on and they all did wear the, the white when they worked in the plant. The white uniform was everybody mm -hmm. that was involved yeah, in the process and wore the white uniform. That's what tell, I remember. <laughs> on the square, you could tell who worked in the Well, that's probably true. White shirts and white that's pants. probably true. Exactly. And, so, and this is Lincoln. Yes, and this the is milk Lincoln. trucks that came from the farm unloaded the milk right up in right here. Right up in here. That's mm -hmm. where the old fire engine is mm -hmm. parked right now. And here's a stack of milk cans right, right there. Mm -hmm. Let's see some of these other pictures. This picture was in 1945. Um, Borden's was very good to always have um, dinners for their employees. This evidently was Christmas. We had an enormous Christmas tree, and these were all the workers that can, were here. Can you point out any of the significant um, people that you remember in those pictures? This is Mr. Umstead, we believe, who was manager of the plant at this time. Um, of course, then you have all your um, office workers, uh, Louise Sullivan, Itasca Gray, Ida Tucker, Virginia Maddox, my mother, Mary Pinkston, and Evelyn, and I cannot remember what her last name was. Um, Red Gordon Barnes was one of the first ones here. He's in this picture. I can't name them all, but uh, well, there, there are a whole, few of them. That's whole going lot back of them. Ways. There are a lot remember of now, them. we're going back about 50 years, and uh, it, uh -huh. it's kind of hard to remember details from that period so in, in your life. We may be going back a little bit longer than 50 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, what about this, this next picture? Okay. This is just a, pr a product of one of the dinners that they had. Um, looks like an awfully good piece of barbecued chicken there. Uh, this is my brother. This was Brian Fulmer, whose father, Paul Fulmer, was the office manager. That's Bobby Pittenger, whose um, grandfather was the first field man. And this is Mr. Charlie Jones, who was one of the first employees. It's like um, was, an orange crush, an old right, orange crush there, and right. Coke in the original bottles. Which I imagine it was a treat. Exactly. <laughs> so. Any more pictures? Of significance you'd like to share with us? This one picture, when we first started having Borden employee reunions in 1978, that year we had the wife of the first superintendent, who was Mrs. White, and the wife of the last superintendent, who was Mr. Holtz. So we, it was a pleasure to have them at our reunion. And three of the employees who had been there so, so long. Uh, Mr. Hugh Bonner, who came, I believe it was 28, Mr. Hugh Bonner came, and Gus Fowler and Red Barnes, who came in 29. And the rest of the pictures are just through the reunions that we've had How through the years. The re re reunions last? When we, was the last, the last one was 2001. And I believe we had 16. So the number, uh, so the number had right. really, kind of really we gone to down. Do this walk mm -hmm. Because, you know, history, time passes, and, and, and you lose some of this context. Right. So while we still had some of these folks like Jane who yeah. knew these people, uh, we wanted to get this mm -hmm. project done. Well, we appreciate the interest in you, you doing it. Right. Like I say, it was very dear to me because my parents met and married here, and then Bill and I met and married. So this when we was were a here too, it's, it's family very family, yeah, you. very close. Jane, yeah. thanks for sharing this with us. Thank you. We're still in the High Bay area, and I think we're painting that shot right now. And this is the unique part of the building. It's the most uh, obvious part of the building from outside because it stands out so much. And I'm standing here with Bill Bradford, who is the husband of Jane that we just previously spoke to, 
And Bill worked down, Bill is with uh, Bradford Appliance now. Bill, when did you start down here at the Borden plant? Uh, 1954. And how old were you probably at that time? About 18. Right out of school? Yep. Okay, and what area did you work in? All of them, but I went to the butter room first. Okay. Now, tell us where the shop was. I had one building over. It'd be back in that far corner. That's mm -hmm. where they repaired things and right. kept the machinery running. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you were in the butter room. That's where it started which is, at. Which we'll go into later. It's the far corner back here outside this high bay area. Right. And that's near where the trucks unloaded. Right. And the milk came out. It was poured into vats. Mm -hmm and went into the churns? No, oh, wait a minute, holding tanks. Holding tanks? Yeah, went okay. into holding tanks and we pumped it out into the other department that we needed it, you know. Okay, depending on right. what you're making that right. day and so what, forth. what you're making. Okay. And, you and in the process of making butter, you know, what typically happens is butter has fat in it, mm -hmm. butter fat. And the butter fat is separated from the fluid milk and turned into butter. First cream and then butter. Right. Uh, you wonder why Fedville got this Borden plant, and and the reason I would guess would be that we probably had a lot of Jersey cows around here. <laughs> yeah. And they knew we had Jersey cows, and Jersey cows give very rich milk. Mm -hmm. Milk from Jersey cows is about five percent butter fat. Milk from Holsteins is about three percent butter fat. So they would typically want to go to an area where they had. Uh, high milk fat production, right. and that's why the Jersey cows were were so important around here. Uh, Bill, tell us some of the stories that you remember about some of the people and some of the things that happened here. There was a football coach that worked here, Jim Barron. He come in and worked with us down here. Come in on night cleanup. And he coached where? He coached high school down here. Central High. Yeah, he was a character. And he worked the night shift as well as coaching. Right. Okay. What did he do? Uh, he just done clean up mainly whatever it needed to do in the butter room, and he was a character. What are some of the things he pulled? He'd, he'd drench us down right good at night with a hose pipe and then take off running, and we had to catch him. <laughs> and we watered him good. A lot of cleanup in the Oh, room. yeah. Now, if you look at the floors, and I don't know, uh, unique floors in this plant. Glazed brick, mm -hmm. glazed brick, and if you notice, it's, it's slanted so that water runs into drains you got drains all throughout this building right and uh, because clean milk was of course probably constantly being spilled right and you had to clean it up what, what was the cleanup just water water and soap water and soap did they ever steam it down uh, if they did i didn't know okay, it but just water and soap right well they kept us busy well we got stuff on the floor you know on them tanks and everything you'd have to wash it out right crawl in them tanks and wash them right good. Of course, that's also why you wore the white uniforms right. all the time, because that's part of the cleanliness that was involved. And one for boarding, that one had no clothes. I guess so. I remember seeing you uptown in those clothes. Uh, did you have another story about Bill Barron? Uh, uh, uh Chasing him in, in, up under something one time? Oh, you mean Jim Barron? Jim Barron, excuse me. Yeah. The story about Clay uh, running him under a vat, a butter vat in there one night. He, we couldn't catch him and, uh, and bunged him up pretty bad, I think. <laughs> so there was, was, so was a little bit of fun involved. He always in, with in him. Working down here. I always. Okay. Any other stories about what went on in the plants? I, would, I probably can't tell them. You can't tell them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, good. No, it was, it was, it was, it was home to me. You know, it, it, Best playing job I ever had in my life. See, and you get started on something like that, and and uh, it it went good, and got had some good people, and uh, that's what made it so great about working here at Borden. And what I found out is good people, and and you just you miss them. Sure you do. Yeah. How many years did you work here? Six, I think that's what Jane said. Okay. And that was it was it was a good uh, they work. I mean, you work day and night, but I mean, you enjoyed it. It's part of a big family and everything, and we had a good time and. Like Jane said, we had all these, we have them suppers we'd eat every once in a while and rest up a little. That's pretty neat. So this was one of the more lucrative jobs to have in, in this area. Right. Because there wasn't that much of a choice as far as industries at that time. No, there wasn't any jobs back exactly. then. I was lucky to get the job. And you were thankful for it. Yes, yes sir. Good. 
Okay, thanks, Bill, for sharing these stories with us. We'll Thank probably you. be talking to him a little bit later. Thank you. Okay, we're at the present time in the Agricultural Hall of the Museum. And, of course, it served another purpose as far as the board and milk plant went in the old days. And I've got with me here, along with Bill Bradford, Don Templeton, who worked at the Borden plant for several years, years ago. And uh, Don, uh, what years did you start? I started on March the 3rd, 1960. And that? I worked for four, four years. And in that first year, I worked here at Borden for up until August the 25th. I was laid off. The next day, Kraft took me on and I worked there. And I held seniority, and which is very unusual to hold seniority in the plant, both plants, for four years. And so I, I thought that's kind of unique. And, uh, you were unique. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty neat. I didn't realize I, uh, that. Competing uh, plants. So I don't what? know where the, both of them was trying to get rid of me or both of them was wanting me to do <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty neat. Okay, tell us a little bit now about where we're standing right now and where the trucks unloaded the milk well, from the, the farm. The trucks come in and then there's a covered area around there that the cr trucks and I never had any part in this when it, when when I was working here but that I did over craft uh, dumping the milk and weighing the milk for each patron and uh, and then the milk goes on from here into holding tanks and is uh is run through separators and different uh other uh other other ways that I I wasn't familiar with, but I know it had to go through other other things besides the separator to get the butter fed out of it, and uh, that uh, then we had separate places for the butter fed to the cream to uh, be stored, and and then the milk went on and went back. At the time I was working here, and I I understand that different years had. Use some of it for different things, but cottage cheese was the main product when I was working here. Yeah. Was uh, was the product? Um, but this was the butter room where we stand. The right butter there. room where it'd be, and I don't remember where the separators were, but I'm sure it was somewhere between this where this milk was received, and the storage tanks that stored milk until it was made into cheese and and different other things. Yeah. I remember them making uh, sour cream. Uh, here, and uh, uh, is is a few other things that I, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to try to tell because my memory is not that good. But uh, but the raw milk came in from the farm into this part of the plant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was at room temperature. Yeah, and it went into some churns, and the process of making butter involved drawing the butter fat out of the fluid milk right. and turning it into butter and then the butter left here in pound cartons uh, on train or on okay. truck to go all over well, the I, country. I believe you know more about that than I do because I didn't help in that yeah. operation. But, they also but I know about the milk and as far as you say you want to hear a little bit about what happened before it got here, I, I had a, a, a part in that too because I, uh, I milked the cows this way and uh, as much our family uh, milked as many as 25 head of Jersey cows by hand. Now you remember back in this time, we're talking about the 20s and 30s, no electricity in the country. Well, now, you, you, you got me older than I am, Doc. Well, I, okay, but <laughs> it's I mean, in the 40s and okay. 50s when I and still was no still milking them. Yeah, right. now, we had electricity, yeah. but we just never did get milkers. Electric milkers. And ever, ever body every family up and down all those hollows back in there where i was raising all over the county and i understand just about the whole uh, east southeast uh got every family depending on the milkshake for for a little extra money exactly 1200 so, different dairy farmers supplied milk to this plant and depending probably on how many children in the family is how many cows they could milk comfortably without electricity, yeah. without electric milkers. Yeah, so and, and a, lot of them, a lot of them had milkers, but uh, we didn't. <laughs> right. So we, uh, of course, they, my parents didn't have milk cows until us kids got up big enough to milk. So they, they knew how to use the kids then. Tell us something about these 10 gallon milk cans uh, this is what the milk was poured into on the farm 
And these cans were carried from the barn to the road, and typically out on the road in front of the farmer's house, next to the mailbox, there was a milk stand. Yes, And they brought great. these out on a little wheelbarrow, put them up on the milk stand, which is about this high. They didn't always have milk stands. Sometimes so, they come off the, the ground. ground. But anyway, <laughs> what, twice a day the milk trucks twice came day, down they, the road? Yeah, they and twice picked up day. those cans and, of course, brought them to town. And if you look at the number on those cans, that signified the farmer. He, right. he was a number, so when that can came into the plant and was dumped out, that number was recorded, the milk was weighed, and he would be paid according to how much milk. It was also... Uh, and, and, the, and the cream content. Cream content. Yeah, it, uh, they, they pay more for if it's uh, higher content of milk right. or, or if cream can, in it. If I can step over this rope just a minute, I'm going to show you a piece of equipment that's pretty interesting. This is a centrifuge, and inside that centrifuge you dropped what's called the Babcock test bottle. And that's what you poured the milk into and spun it in that centrifuge. And when you got through spinning it, the top of the little bottle had a long, thin tube and the, the milk fat rose to the top and it was graduated with numbers on it. And you knew exactly what the milk fat content was of the milk that was brought in that day from that farm. And so he was paid by the volume of milk, and he was also paid by the butterfat content. That's why the Jersey cow was so important, because she had the highest test in milk. And, of course, here are the cans. Later on, when we got electricity, these cans were put in the coolers, yeah. electric coolers. This was full of water. A lot of, the, a lot of the bigger farmers that had more, uh, more milk, they would get a cooler. To, we, they had never got a cooler either. And uh, we... But they coming twice today, you know, you didn't have to worry as much about it. There's a compressor on top that yeah. cooled the water, cool the water. That, that surrounded the milk can. Some people even used springs. They had springs that was handy enough that they could keep it sitting in, in cool springs. To, uh, to exactly. The, and, I, uh, and to go back to the farm level a little bit, now when you were milking that cow by hand, you had this milk bucket underneath the cow, it's got, it's, if you look, it's partially covered to not, keep, not, mine, well, not <laughs> yours, but a lot of them, yeah. The, that cover is to protect the dirt and the manure and the hair from yeah. getting in the milk. So when the farmer got this milk bucket full, he took it and brought it over here to the can and poured it into this. Yeah. There, was a, there was a filter, a cloth filter. Got the cats back. There was a cloth filter down inside this. The milk was poured into that filter, and then it slowly went through there down into the uh, can, and it was free of dirt and right. hair and filth right. and so forth. Uh, here's a here's a stool that the farmer put down under the cow. I, I still have one a whole lot like that. And that's uh, that's typically the way they were made. That's an old milk can with three little legs yeah. welded on the bottom of it. So you pulled your seat up under the cow with the bucket, milked her by hand, and then put the milk in that can. Yes. These are cow bales. <laughs> if you had... We didn't have one. We had a, <laughs> but, we had a, uh, a dog that... You always did have a, a stock dog. Yeah. Typically, if you had a dozen cows, one of them would have, have a, a bell. bell on, so that when you went out at dark early in the morning, you could listen for that bell and know where to go, what part of the woods to go to to bring the cows out to the milk barn. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Any other stories about things that happened in here, people you remember? Well, I, since we're on that subject of the hauling the milk in, uh, Doc, I, uh, I, like I say, we milked, and a milk truck driver would come by, and I'd see these people riding those milk trucks in the back, you know, with the open doors on each side, and that just, that just amazed me. So uh, our milk truck driver's son wasn't old enough to, uh, to snatch the cans and put milk in, but he could... Uh, he knew where they went, so I got the driver to let me go 
part of his route, which would take me all around for most of his route, and then he'd drop me off and I'd walk back home, and I'd get to snatch those cans. I thought that was doing something. For free, probably. For, but, well, he'd, well, occasionally he'd give me a dollar bill or something like that. <laughs> That's pretty neat. That's good. That, uh, that built up a little muscle, too, didn't it? It did, Because yeah. those cans were right at 100 pounds. Well, if he, if he knew that it was full, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't let me try it. He would get out. The driver would get out and, and load them because he's yeah. used to it. But, uh, you know, half can, three-quarter can. Of, of you could handle that. I can handle that. Yeah. And again, as we're walking through, notice the slant to the floor and the, the drains uh, where they were washing down and taking care and keep, keeping the plant clean. Uh, you're approaching that corner there, Doc, and there is a hallway there where it used to be when I was working here and that's how we came in every day and that's where we punched our time clock they the little door goes on outside and we would uh, we'd come through that on to our appointed jobs right that's the rotary room now and I think you can look at this little hall if we can get the camera to take a peek back there okay yeah that was that and was the it. outside doors right out there right your honor where your clock stood uh, set right on, as you come in that other door right. so. Yeah, that was a time clock. And Don, tell us about the union. There was a union here for the workers? There was a union here and at Kraft both they had unions. And as uh, Becky said earlier, I guess probably told you that the union then was to help people when they needed it, you know, and we didn't try not to let it be as troublesome as you'd hear others being. But Do you remember the name of the union? Was it? I, I should, but I can't, yeah. so uh, I won't try to. Uh, give the wrong name, but it was uh, it it was a uh, a union, and it was to help. And, right. and like you say, we uh, uh, Bill has said earlier, we appreciated being able to get a good good job. And uh, I had just come out of the army, and my brother had worked here prior to me, and at Craft Bow. So when it came the time to call Ray, my brother. Well, he had gone to college and he wasn't home. And mother said, I was just down the arm and no job of any kind. And mom said, but I got another boy that I can, that will come up there and, and work for you. So uh, she, I, she sent me up here. So you came here after your stand in the army? Yeah, right okay. after the army. I, I, I thought I was going to be a, a farmer. That's all I ever thought about doing. So, but when I got out, I saw I was going to need something besides farming all together so I uh, she sent me up here and, and I went from here to craft and worked back and forth for 13 years. Don is a is one of these multi-talented people that, that I call <laughs> he can do anything <laughs> working at two plants at the same time for one thing he farmed his family's always been in farm, farming uh, Don is a is a horseman too He's had walking horses walking. all of his life. No he still time. breaks horses. Uh, he broke a leg or a hip not <laughs> too many years ago doing that, but he's always yeah. been involved with horses. He's also a premier uh, honeybee expert. If you want to know something about bees, uh, t talk to Don. Tell us just a little bit about your horse operation and your, and your honeybee. Well, I, uh, of course, I... I've, I've just enjoyed work. I, work. I enjoy when I work at the milk plants, and I enjoyed all my jobs. And I, I always like to hear the uh, the idea that if, if you enjoy your work, you don't ever work a day in your life. So I, I think it, I'm a prime example for that because I've enjoyed everything I did. And that uh, uh, walking horses was uh, attracted to me, and I spent a lot of time broke a lot of good walking horses along with my other work at the farm and and working here too and uh, when, when I, did you get involved with honeybees i got involved with honeybees about uh 1970 uh two or three uh, one of the foremans over at craft came to me one day and wanted to put bees on me because he had been reading got uh, got interested in them and i said sure claude i'll uh, you can put them out there. I'd like, maybe I'd like to go with you. And he said, that's good. But before the, before we ordered the bees, he had, uh, his wife had got him busy 
doing furniture refinishing, so she, he didn't uh, he didn't get his bees, but that started me. He put the. <laughs> That's pretty neat. The bill, yeah. There's one other room we want to go into right here. If we can step right down here, and Don, I wanted to ask you or, or Bill, Bill, if you'll come out here again. This is a unique kind of floor right here. This grid work was it open? Was it an open grid? Like could you see through it? Or? Like I can't tell you, okay. but I feel sure it was just like this all the time. Wasn't it? Was it like yeah. this? Yeah. Okay, it's it's kind of funny, but probably water and drains yeah. were underneath this. That's, that's original too. Okay, well, probably, could you lift some of this up to clean out the drains or something? Because this is... They had to go through here. That's what okay. those drains are, young. Okay, drains. but that's, this is just yeah. unique, and I just wondered what the what the, the function of this... Furnace, I mean, the boiler room, not the boiler cooler in here. It went through these two doors. Okay, in, we just recently redid this room for the art room, and in order to redo it, we had to tear down the walls because they were they were stuff was falling off of them and when we examined what was on the room y'all step on in here when we examined the lining of these walls it was cork cork lining about 10 inches deep which is an insulation material right. so this was a re refrigeration room where apparently the butter and the cottage cheese would have been temporarily stored till it was loaded on the that train was my first day your first that's day was back I'm here? Packing the, packing the stuff in here. Packing it in here. Yeah. First day. That's my first this, check. This but, is the cooler room. Yeah. It, come out, it had that's doors, two, two different doors at that time that here. here and uh, sometimes you could take a shortcut through there, but people with glasses on didn't want to go through there. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> so up. One day I found a pair of uh, glass rims without the glasses in them. So I got telling the boys, old fellas that had uh, the glasses on, I said, I got some glasses here that don't fog up when you go. <laughs> and I just I just had them tore all to pieces. <laughs> it went out it was outside. The railroad and, right up right, the Right, and plane. we had a truck, a truck line backed in there and load all this stuff out. It was a refrigerated truck. And the container's about this tall, boxes square, you know. Okay. And that, that's cream. Did it leave on the train and trucks? No, no, it left on the truck. Oh, okay, so the, what did the train bring in? Uh, coal for the furnace. Coal for here. the furnace. Right. Okay, that's that's pretty neat. And, and that uh, railroad track went up almost to the fairgrounds. It, it did, I think, and it tore. You know, they tore it out. You tore it out years ago. That's real good language. I think we pointed out in that aerial photograph the feed uh, mill, which was at. This yeah, diagonal across. corner across the street, and right. then beyond that was another building. I'm not sure we Tennessee, talked about what was that building. Tennessee fan, uh, Tennessee can. Tennessee can, coming where the 10 gallon milk cans were. Right, made. that's where they're made. Now, if I remember, those cans would take a beating and they'd get kind of beat up, and you could redo them. Right. And they, Did they redo them at that plant? Yeah. And they, they came out and they were real shiny. Was it some kind of a galvanized? I guess they polished zinc. them. They polished them down polished and them. covered them real good. Well, they were pretty when they were redone. They were heavy. You, you pull a bunch of them, like Don said all day. You have done a day's work. And then when you fill them with milk, you know, milk's eight pounds for the gallon. Yeah, that's eighty pounds plus hmm. another twenty pounds for the can. That's about a hundred pounds. Well, right? I handle a lot of cans down here because I was a dump man. The dump man. I was you one dumped of them. The cans. That come right through that wall, that kind. Really. And I dumped the milk in there, and they'd call me and see well, if somebody was out. They'd have me or somebody else to go fill that fill that job up. And there's one driver one day filled it. You're supposed to smell of the lead, you know, when you come through there, and you, put, you this thing down here will work like it and work the leads loose. And you smell of the leads, and you're supposed to take a a little a cup of some kind of liquid in there, and it would turn color, different colors, and let you know what it was. So it was bad, but I didn't check it, see, and I dumped <laughs> two, one cup, one can full of that stuff in the vat, and it couldn't go through, and we had to clean it. Now, the man had done it. He laughed, and I said, you'll pay for that, buddy. <laughs> so, some of the furnace, funny stories about some of the things that happened. Hmm. When you talk about the boiler room. Yeah. What did you need that much heat for? What was it, Don? Well, when they was running the dryer room, I mean, the, yeah, the dryer, they, they, they needed more, so they didn't run all the uh, boilers when I was here. But uh, Mr. Uh, Buck Pittenger, he was the boiler man, and he uh, he took care of them, and he was still doing it when I was here, but he just wasn't running as much. So uh, they had needed 
They had needed it at one time, but didn't need it at that time. And so, so the energy involved in drying was was heat in with fans or what? Well, now I can't I can't answer that one for you. I just uh, steam line running up there, okay. come out of that, and that's well, where it dry that stuff with. I just took that for granted it's happening. I didn't. I didn't take no part in that. Yeah, I didn't ask no question. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna walk back out here, and uh, we just really enjoyed hearing these stories from uh, some of these not old timers but former employees of the Borden Milk Plant. Now let's talk about all the products that were made here during the life of this plant. Uh, starting with butter, what else was made here? Cream. Cream. Well, cottage cheese was our main uh, item then. That's the main thing. And, uh, but I remember one time, about right along here somewhere, was uh, uh, we packaged that... Uh, Dale Shire. Is what? that it? What was that uh, stuff? The we... cream that is pack, you know, packaged in uh, spray cans to, for your whip, ready whip. Those really? cans. We, we, yeah, we, it, it wasn't very long, but they made it for some time. And I, 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 I must have been helping run that because when, when they bust or something other, I'd get get as much of that <laughs> <laughs> sweet cream or whatever <laughs> it flow for free. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sour cream. Yeah. Sour, sour cream was here. And uh, powdered milk. Yeah, that that, was, now that was for my my real time. No, I remember just a little of it. I got here yeah. when and they was making that stuff. See that that's during the war. They when that uh, I understand this now from other people telling me that 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 drying room out there that's when they dried and powdered got powdered milk there powdered was eggs, for use doing yeah, and eggs too and also powdered lemons. Okay, dried lemons. Yeah, juice. well now that. Uh, uh, I, 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 yeah, I believe I did hear that too, but it. I didn't uh, know all this stuff. Yeah, well, they they uh, they used that pan then, but now when I got here, it was completely uh, closed and already empty. That, that do, do you remember seeing the pound cartons of butter? Did you, did no, you ever see them? No, now that's something I didn't see and have any did, part did in. Did most either. of the products that left here have the Borden trademark on them? You remember what the Borden trademark? They didn't. Uh -uh, uh, not on cottage cheese. Did and, you? and cottage cheese, it had every every name you could imagine. It went from to here to places. Florida and all. Jane's everywhere. over there in the corner shaking her head. Elsie the cow, wasn't that the board and trademark? And yeah. we have a picture of Elsie. Come on out here, Jane. We had a picture of Elsie over here on the other side of the building that you might want to. But that was the yeah, board and yeah. trademark. That picture of Elsie the cow, and I guess she was a. A Jersey or a Guernsey cow. One of the two. One, one of the two. <laughs> but uh, but that was the Borden trademark for years and years and years, and it was a patented trademark. That was that was theirs. Yeah. Now I I, I know what you're talking about now, and I uh, I couldn't think what you were yeah, what referring I, to, but that yeah. yeah we and we ha we had something like that on. Uh, of course, we had uh, cottage cheese that we packaged in in uh, Borden's Contain. containers, but we had. Uh, a cottage cheese that had all I, I remember in uh, working in the packing room packing cheese for a whole lot of uh, companies down in uh, Florida in Florida really where we where we sent a lot of cottage cheese yeah. to. So. and another important thing after all these products that board manufactured in this plant were taken out of the milk the raw milk that came mm -hmm. in over that con there was still something left Way. and that was whey and whey was the liquid watery part of the milk minus all the fat that had been taken out of it to make butter and cottage and cheese, solids, and, all, cheese all and the solids. All the solids but out. it still had some protein in it and it had some sugar in it. It'd make and an the, old hog fat. And the whey was yeah. given away. <laughs> yeah. Was yeah. it stored in a big tank over here somewhere? Yeah. And, and and I remember seeing farmers' trucks lined yeah, up back right here, yeah. pickup trucks and yeah. tongue trucks, and right. they'd have a hundred or two hundred gallon tank in, and they would pull in under that tank and fill up with whey, yeah. carry it to the farm, and then pour it out into troughs for the hogs. And there I was did, I did that too. There I was had, a many a hog a fattened on whey yeah. and yeah. turned into bacon and ham that in this in this county yeah. from from whey, and that was. Uh, that was a free product, but it produced a lot of yeah. meat for the yeah. American public. My brother hauled it. He hauled away. Hauled away. He had hogs. 
Okay, we're going to talk a little bit now about the transportation that was involved in moving the product from this plant uh, to other parts of the country. And we know that for many years we had a railroad line that ran right up the street, right which is the south portion of this building. What was the railroad doing? Well, now, that that's another thing that I don't remember ever loading a train car. So all the cheese, cottage cheese that I ever loaded went in a uh, big trailer truck. Semis. Frigid, Semis, frigid yeah. Air. In a refrigerated truck. I'm right. sure I didn't ask that question. I didn't, I didn't load any on the train either. I didn't know where they carried. Well, what did the train bring in? Uh, like you said, coal. Coal for the yeah. boilers. The boilers. That's the only energy. thing I've seen it bring in unless you brought in parts or something like that. Okay. But that's all. That's the transportation I know that's come in here. And this was just the end of a spur. Right, that's the end of a spur. That came off the main it, line. I, I no, now that, no, it, that it, went, it went out across that road. It's, you know, it backed because it went on up the road. Okay. And that railroad, you had to stop for a railroad track out here. Okay. So that's, that's but where. But the main line went back right. towards town. Right. And that was either probably the L and N Railroad or the NC and St. L from Chattanooga. Right. But it came through Federal and went to Lewisburg. And it's about back this way, yeah, when it went back that way, it took a left out there and went to Lewisburg. Right. And went on up, I'm sure. That's what the only thing I know well, about that. trains were a lot more important in the earlier days than they are now because yeah. we don't even have a, a don't train into Federal anymore. He didn't, no, I don't think so, do we? No, no, we've got a spur down at near uh, Ardmore. Did yeah. you believe that I could hear that train this morning? I've heard it in my yeah. house. On a clear, cold morning. Oh, you clear, cold morning. Right I can hear it at right. Del Rose. Exactly. You're a lot closer to it, of course, than I am. We're going to conclude this program this morning, and uh, I'm certainly in debt to these former employees that have helped us do this tour this morning. Uh, Jane Bradford and Don Templeton and Bill Bradford and Becky Gross, who just left. Uh, they really uh, served a... a, a real good purpose in helping us bring back some of the old times of this plant and I hope that as you pass by South Main now and you look over here at this big old awesome old plant you'll remember what it was how important it was in earlier times we hope you'll visit it even now as our museum has taken over this building was donated to the museum in about 1960 or about 1986 by Mr. William R. Carter, uh, owner of CFW who passed away just a few years back. We're indebted to Mr. Carter and his family for donating this building uh, to the uh, museum. And we want to thank this morning uh, Federal Public Utilities and Don Counts who's been our producer and cameraman this morning for providing this uh, historical time for us, and uh, we do thank everybody that's involved. Amen. Amen.